Hey guys, this is Holland Chambers Biology coming to you with a lecture on reproductive isolation for our unit on evolution. Now the first thing we're going to talk about here is um, how reproductive isolation drives evolution to begin with. So we're going to be talking about barriers, okay? Now there's many types of barriers that we're going to be dealing with, whether they are physical barriers, um, sexual barriers, they might be behavioral barriers, um, and all of this um, leads to the segregation and limited breeding opportunities for these organisms and therefore drives speciation, so the creation of a new species. Um, and so the first thing I want to kind of um, go over is we're going to be talking about two different um, types of reproductive isolation. One is pre-mating and the second is post-mating, okay? So the first one, let's go and talk about is pre-mating. So these are mechanisms that can happen um, before you actually mate that isolates the species. The first one is known as temporal isolation. This is also referred to as aleopatric speciation. Um, temporal is timing. So, you know, Amoeba Sisters does a really good job, so feel free to always, you know, watch one of their videos um, to get kind of extra help on this as well. Um, but you've got one flower saying, hey, wake up, it's time to release their pollen, and the other flower is still sleeping. So if the timing of reproduction doesn't match with that species, then they're not able to actually exchange DNA and um, create... Um, a, a new species or a hybrid. And so this actually helps to reduce hybridization and increases the successfulness of that specific species. So here are some um, animal examples. You've got the western and eastern spotted skunks, um, which actually mate. One mates in the fall and one mates in the um, late winter. Um, the kingfishers are isolated um, based off of timing of when they actually mate on the different islands or within the same island, they're mating at different times. Um, the American toad versus the fowler's toad, again, early summer versus late summer. So because these guys are mating at different times, they are no longer exchanging DNA and therefore become isolated, separated, and eventually over time and become a new species. Now, the second pre-mating isolation is behavioral. Now, behavioral is um, like a mating courtship. So it's a song, it's a dance. Um, it might even be building a nest. So um, down here on the bottom, you can see the satin um, bowerbird decorates its, its nest with these like blue sticks, whereas um, the McGregor's bowerbird actually decorates its nest with charcoal. And so because of the nesting, behavioral differences, these birds no longer mate together. Here are some other um, pretty cool examples. The blue-footed booby here um, actually does like a certain type of dance um, to show off their feet. And so um, that's how the female is attracted to that specific species. So sometimes the boobies will fly over the females um, to just kind of show their feet. Um, and you know, other birds you've got in like the Amazon they flash their feathers, um, maybe it's a song like the meadowlark. Even though these birds look really, really similar, um, this guy's song is way different from this one's song. So that they're, they're, that way they attract different mates and again create the species line. Now, a third one is known as mechanical isolation. Mechanical, I know this sounds really, really awkward, um, but this is the actual copulation attempt. So the physical mating of one animal to another. Um, sometimes the physicality um, is anatomically incapable. So a Great Dane is not gonna be able to mate with a chihuahua. It just physically doesn't fit. Um, and you know, this is um, down here on the bottom is a damselfly. Um, again, it just physically doesn't fit. Um, this is a classic example also of snails, the genital openings, they just don't line up, so therefore they cannot mate whatsoever. 
Okay, the fourth one um, of pre-mating is geographical. So geographical is a physical barrier. So the Grand Canyon, maybe it was a big river, a mountain, an island, um, some type of physical entity um, is blocking the organisms from actually reaching each other and therefore they, be, they remain isolated. Um, when that isolation occurs, again, they can only mate with that side of the island or that side of the mountain species. And so that in turn creates a divergence of gene pools and allele frequencies, which will drive speciation and the creation of new species. So here are some more examples. You've got, um, you know, the different types of um, pork fish, um, again, because they're based off of one side, the Caribbean versus the Pacific. Um, you also have the Northern Spotted Owl versus the Mexican Spotted Owl. Somehow, some way, um, the original population was flown to different sides and just never came back. Um, the Arctic Fox and the Gray Fox, again, they're, you know, that's a pretty big range, but for some reason they're not able to come back together. And so that in turn, I, again, you can see here classically, those recessive alleles must have traveled with the Arctic fox. And because they're no longer mating with the gray fox, those recessive alleles became predominant in a snowy environment. That became advantageous, give them a million years of isolation, and they become a different species. So no longer is the Arctic fox going to be mating with the gray fox. Okay. Now, um, the second thing is a little bit more confusing. This is actually post mating. So if they're able to get over the mountain, if they're able to physically connect together and mate, um, some things can actually happen. So first off is the gamete incapability. So um, coral do this a lot. When they release their egg and sperm into the water, the coral species has specific connections to the other gametes. And so if it's not the right species, the egg and sperm won't actually connect. It just doesn't know how to do, how to, it, doesn't, it doesn't register. So it doesn't um, create a baby. Um, zygote mortality, um, if the animals do mate together, um, the baby ends up dying um, in just in the development stage. If it does actually give birth to a baby, the baby is so weak that it doesn't live very long and it dies. Um, also, if the species end up uh, mating together, you end up creating a hybrid. So a classic example is a liger and a tigalon. Um, if a male lion mates with a female tiger, you get a liger. But if you do the opposite and you mate a male tiger with a lioness, you get a tigon. And so a tigon um, and the liger are both hybrids and therefore they are actually um, weaker than the original species and most hybrids um, are sterile. You also get the last bit, which not only are your hybrids weak and sterile, but um, you can also create a hybrid that can mate only once, create one generation of children, but the rest of those generations of children are infertile. And so that stops the line. So here, another example, a horse and a donkey. Horses can mate with horses, totally fine. Donkeys with donkeys, totally fine. But when a horse and a donkey come together, they create a hybrid, which is your mule, and the mule is sterile, and therefore two mules cannot actually mate together. Now, what's the point of all of this? Well, the importance of reproductive isolation, um, whether it's pre or post, um, is to not only drive evolution and increase variation, but also help species in um, recognition in order to create a stable population. So you don't want to be creating all these hybrids that in turn are going to maybe outcompete the original population. Does that make sense? Like you don't want to be creating all these organisms that can't have babies because then your population dies off. And so you want to be able to mate successfully, have viable offspring, um, and at the same time, um, this idea of separation by creating new species 
that are viable, that can create more of their own, actually adds to genetic diversity. Genetic diversity helps with your environmental sustainability. So the more animals you have in an ecosystem, the healthier it actually is. So we get our predator and preys, all of our different, you know, breakdown of the trophic levels, um, all of that aids in the sustainability of our, of our world. So this is actually a good thing. Um, and again, by keeping them isolated, it ensures um, that the offspring themselves can continue the line um, of generation after generation of remaining on the planet. So hopefully this helps you guys understand um, what reproductive um, isolation actually is. Um, again, it helps to drive evolution. And um, you know, you have two types, pre and post. Um, the three that I would like for you guys to um, definitely know is number one, temporal isolation, which is timing. Please also make sure you guys know number two, behavioral isolation, which is your song and dance. Um, number three is your mechanical, okay? And then number four is your geographical, all right? So those are the big top dogs that you guys need to know for um, reproductive isolation and evolution. And make sure that you guys are using this information when you are writing your lab analysis, um, answering those questions, and of course, um, writing your response questions to some of the homework worksheets that I'm giving you. So this is Holland Chambers Biology. Thanks for listening. And until next time, I'm checking out.